Thank you for listening to Emmanuel Baptist Church's podcast. For more information about the church, please visit our website at www.emmanuelmanning.com. Thanks and enjoy the sermon. Last week we looked at, um, and I thought maybe over the next couple of weeks we could just look at the attributes of God. Honestly, if you were to boil down what I try to teach about here, it usually boils down to the gospel and the attributes of God. Uh, and so I thought over the next couple of weeks, uh, while we still have Wednesday service in June, um, so I'll do next week. And then the following week, I'll do that. Uh, and then on the 20, is it the 26th? Uh, Elder Brewer will be bringing the word. So we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, but for tonight, in the next couple of weeks, let's just look at some of God's attributes uh, again together. And tonight in Mark 10, we're going to look at uh, the goodness of God. Um, and so our text is verses 17 through 22. It's a very famous story. It's one we've looked at a few times. Uh, But it's a good jumping off point for looking at uh, the doctrine of God's goodness together. So this is Jesus' run in with uh, the rich young ruler. I don't think he's called the rich young ruler in Mark. Uh, We learn that he's a ruler from one of the other gospels and we learn that he's rich from a third. But putting it all together, he's the rich young ruler uh, and he has an interchange with Jesus. So I'll have the text on the screen up here if you can read it. If not, Mark 10, 17 through 22. As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these Things I've kept from my youth, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, we've mentioned this before, but this is a passage that... Um, can easily be uh, misunderstood because what exactly is uh, Jesus doing here? The man pitches him a softball, right? If someone were to walk up to you and say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I bet everybody in this room would have an answer just waiting, chomping at the bit to tell them about believing in Jesus and trusting in his cross and repentance and faith. This young man pitches Jesus a softball, and Jesus really rebukes him. And it's hard to understand why. This young man, who seems uh, legitimate, uh, comes up to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And of all the things that Jesus could have focused on, he focuses on that. Good teacher, which would have been a real mark of honor in that day you know he calls him rabbi that would have been normal but a good teacher Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life and here's how Jesus answers him why do you call me good no one is good except God alone and so some people have taken two things from this that maybe what Jesus is doing here is saying um, he's making an argument for his deity don't call me good only God is good or maybe he's making an argument against his deity Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Or some people think that the point of this passage is that every person who's a Christian should sell all that they have and give to the poor. Raise of hands, how many of you have done that? Okay, so let's hope it's not that then, right? If none of us have done that, uh, you know, because is Jesus saying, if you're going to inherit eternal life, then the way to inherit eternal life is sell all that you have and give it to the poor. If that's the way to eternal life, then all of us are headed towards eternal death. So you maybe instinctually know, maybe there's something in that, but that's not it. So what's going on here? What is Jesus doing? 
Well, Jesus is giving him a very thinly veiled rebuke. And here's how, how we know it. When he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This young man is probably asking something like, Jesus, what good things do I need to do to go to heaven? What good things do I need to do to enter into the kingdom? What are the good things you want me to do? Give me a rule. Give me a good thing and I'll do it. And the way that Jesus answers that is, there is no one good but... Now, how does that answer his question? If there's no one good but God, and you're asking, what's the good thing I have to do to go to heaven? And Jesus says, there is no one good. Then what is Jesus saying? You got no hope, right? You got no hope if it's down to you. If it's down to your goodness, you have no hope. And the reason we know that this is what's going on is because Jesus immediately goes to the commandments, right? He says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father, father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, these things I've kept for my youth. So this dude's obviously better than us because how many of you would actually answer Jesus going, yeah, I pretty much got that covered. I don't, I don't think I would. I mean, no matter which one of those you focus on, uh, I probably would not do very well. But this young man said, I've kept these things from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you only lack one thing, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. What in the world is Jesus doing? Well, in order to show him that he's not good, Jesus immediately goes to the law. Now remember, God gave his law, and there's a lot of different purposes for the law, but one of the main purposes of, for God's law is to show us that we can't do it. That's one of the main purposes of God's law. He doesn't give you the Ten Commandments and go, here, do the best you can. He gives you the Ten Commandments, in all honesty, to kind of grind into you the truth that you can't do it. Paul got this, because in Romans 7 he says, the very thing I want to do, this I don't do. The very thing I wish I wouldn't do, that's what I end up doing. The very thing I love, I don't do, and the very thing I hate, that's what I want to do. That is what happens with someone who honestly struggles with God's law. And so Jesus says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, all these sorts of things. The only, and this man, what he had done is he had probably done what we do. He had defined all of the laws so that he could be in the, in the realm of those who keep it. So... Oh, I haven't literally killed anybody. I haven't literally commi committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I've, I've never lied. Uh, honor of father and mother. And so what Jesus does is Jesus actually here goes back to the very first of the Ten Commandments. Anybody know what that one is? You shall have no other gods before me. And Jesus just applies that law to this young man. He says this, good. Take everything you have then and sell it and give it to the poor and come follow me. Now, is that what Jesus may have been literally asking this man to do? Very, very likely. But I don't think the point of this story is that that's what we all need to do. The point of this story is there's only one good person. And who is that good person? It's God. And what Jesus is teaching here. And this is, I really do believe, what fundamentally separates Christianity from all other religions. Is that all other religions, in some form, all basically say, you've got to give something good to God. And that's the fundamental thing of our religion. And the thing that's fundamentally true about Christianity is that it is fundamentally about God being good to you. And if you mess up that order, you're going to end up somewhere that's not Christian. Now, you may say, Drew, God calls us to do a whole lot of things. Man, you're exactly right. He does. He, he calls us to do a whole lot of things. But all the things that God calls us to do, he calls us to do in response to his goodness. Nothing has ever started with us being good. It's all started with God being good. Because none of us can be good enough on our own for God. And you know your own heart. I know my own heart. I know the kind of wickedness that is down there. 
even though I've never literally murdered someone or committed adultery or yada, 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 yada. It's all there. And so the point to be taken from our story tonight is there is no one good but God, but praise the Lord, God is what? He's good. He is good, and because he's good, uh, we can uh, look to him um, for all things. And that's really the point of what's going on in this story. Only God is good, and it's not about our goodness. It's about God's goodness. So let's think for a few minutes tonight uh, about the goodness of God. And here's our first point. God is good. He, he is good. Now, that is a word that, if we're not careful, uh, we can misunderstand. Because often we use the word good like, and I think I've said this before, we use the word good like the Smurfs use the word Smurf, right? They just kind of stuck it in in good place. It didn't have much meaning. It's just, you know, that's a, that's a Smurfing excellent cake you made. Or, or when we use the word good, we tend to use the word good to mean something like that which is practical, right? This is a good hammer. Those were good beams. Uh, this is a good church. It's practical. It, it, it maybe it is what it should be. Uh, but then the more we think about goodness, kind of the, the harder it is to define because that which is practical isn't always good. For instance, a few years ago, there's a guy named Richard Dawkins who tweeted out this stat that 90% of pregnancies that are shown to have Down syndrome end in abortion. And what he said is, that's not good. It should be 100%. Right? That's what he said. Because his way of thinking is the only good life is a life where you can live to your full potential and have, don't have all these things to overcome. And kids with Down syndrome are a weight on their parents and a weight on society, which for any of you who've ever met anybody with Down syndrome, you like know that's not true. Like they are the happiest people that you meet. And people responded to that tweet, people with Down syndrome talking about the businesses they've started and the charities that they've run and all this kind of stuff. Sometimes the good isn't practical. And so when we begin to, and I'm sorry I went philosophical there with you for a second, but if we begin to ask that question, what is goodness? Well, we have to go, God is good. And God is what goodness is. The Bible makes this clear uh, time and time again. Verses like 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. If we're trying to define goodness. We have to look at God. God is the one who tells us what good is. And it's right to do that because he is God. And what does A.W. Tozer say about the goodness of God? The goodness of God is that which disposes him to be kind, cordial, benevolent, and full of goodwill toward men. He is tender-hearted and of quick sympathy, and his unfailing attitude toward all moral beings is open, frank, and friendly. By his nature, he is inclined to bestow blessedness, and he takes holy pleasure in the happiness of his people. And God being good is one of the fundamental things about him. You can really fundamentally boil down God's being to just a handful of attributes that express themselves in many ways. One is God exists of himself. Another is that God is holy. And a third is that God is good because his goodness is beneath so many of the other attributes. Listen to what it says. This is Wayne Grudem. Thus God's mercy is what? His goodness towards those in distress. His grace is his goodness towards those who deserve only punishment. His patience is his goodness towards those who continue to sin over a period of time. No wonder it was so fundamental to the people of Israel that God is good. That They talk about his goodness all the time. In Ezra 3.11, when the temple was on its way to being rebuilt, it said they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. 
2 Chronicles 5, 13. Again, this is in the context of the temple. It was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, they were to say, the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. First Chronicles 16, 34, we read that. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Psalm 16, 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. That doesn't mean that there aren't good things in our lives. It's just that the only way to enjoy those good things best is to enjoy them as having been given to us by God. I'm not sure if this will resonate with you, but Augustine said this, he loves anything too little who does not love it for your sake. Right? So our children, our spouses, our homes, those things are good because they're blessings of God. We have no good apart from him. Psalm 25, 8, good and upright is the Lord. I just went southern on y'all. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 106, praise the Lord, for he is good. And on and on and on it goes. The goodness of God is one of the foundations of his character. But we must admit, God is not good to all in the same way, is he? Even though he is open and benevolent to all, that doesn't mean that all are open and benevolent to him. This is why John Frame would say, God is good to all, but that is not to say that he gives the same blessings to everyone. He's not obligated to do that, and he does not do it. His goodness to the elect, for example, is very different from his goodness to the reprobate. But even the reprobate, reprobate, say that five times fast, receive God's blessings of rain and sunshine. Those blessings are substantial, so much so that they ought to motivate repentance, though the reprobate refuse to give heed. And so he concludes by saying this. An important conclusion to this is that nobody can complain that God has not been good to him. We got rain today, didn't we? Now we got stuff that's growing and the heat's slacked off a little bit um, and all of us are here and relatively healthy and uh, hopefully happy. God has been good to every one of us uh, no matter our condition. And so one of the foundation stones of who God is is that he's good and that goodness reflects itself in all of his good attributes towards us, his mercy, his grace, his patience. Not only is God good, God does good. God does good. What do I mean by that? Now, creation is good, ain't it? I mean, when the Lord, the Lord made, it's kind of funny. If somebody is both the artist and the main judge of their own work, most artists like do their art and then they put it forward for the world to judge. When God was making everything, he was the artist and he was the judge of his own work, right? And every day when he made something, he's like, you know what? That's good. That's good. Right? And then on the day he made man, he said, that's very good. Very good. Creation is good. 1 Timothy 4.1.5 says this. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Boy, this sounds really intense, doesn't it? Teachings of demons, deceitful spirits. What will these people say? These insincere, demon-possessed, deceitful spirit-inspired people. Well, they'll forbid marriage. And they'll require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. This is a very interesting point. God believes that everything that he made was good. And sometimes if we're not careful, we tend to sort of think that we're more holy than God is. And one of the ways that we can think that we're more holy than God is, is if we say that things that he made aren't good. 
One of the ways that you can know that your own heart is slipping into legalism is when you blame something God made instead of your own sin. Right? So it says they forbid marriage as if sex is bad. Sex ain't bad, is it? It's good. And I can say that as a Baptist from a pulpit because God made it and he made it for our pleasure and, and it's awesome. Bodies are good, aren't they? You're like, mine's kind of falling apart here. Well, they weren't meant to, but bodies are good. And food, food, food is good, isn't it? I mean, uh, fajitas, uh, pineapple cake, water when you're thirsty, food is good. And there may be some things of it that we can't eat because of certain bodily sort of things. But the Bible is pretty clear here that if God made it, we shouldn't call it bad, should we? No, we shouldn't call it bad because the Lord made everything to be received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer, which basically, this is actually really, really helpful. The, the, the best kind of diet is the can I thank God for it diet. And can you, can you genuinely, really from your heart, thank the Lord for the third hot dog? You're like, sometimes. Okay, you see what I'm saying, though. God made things to be good. And so creation is good. Food is good. Marriage is good. And we don't want to fall prey to hyper-spiritual people who think that they're more holy because they can say no louder to things. The key uh, is to say yes to good things in good proportion in right contexts and celebrate them and to wait on the right context when we need to. This is what I tell kids when I talk to them about sex. I don't think I've had one of these conversations here, but basically I just say it's worth waiting for. Right? We talk about it as if it's bad. I'm not going to do that. It's awesome, and it's worth waiting for. God made it good in the right context, and so we should not forbid things that God has made because he's made them good. I just did something I shouldn't have done. There we go. Not only is God's creation good, God's word is good. God's word is good. This is one of the first Bible verses I've memorized. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your you good. In other words, if God's word is good, then what God says is good. I sometimes find myself thinking this, and maybe you do as well, in my weaker moments, that to do it the Bible's way is somehow not the best way. Sometimes I try to be smarter than the Bible. You ever find yourself trying to be smarter than the Bible? I try to be smarter than the Bible a lot. Well, I know that's what you clearly say I should do, Lord, but it makes more sense to me in this situation to do it this way. And in essence, what we're saying when we do that is, well, we're saying the same thing the devil said about God's word in the Garden of Eden, right? We think that behind his commandments is a, a withdrawing closed hand. But that's not the way that it works, is it? Behind all of God's commandments is a genuine heart to do us good. And so we should listen to him in those areas of our life that are really difficult. And all of us, by our personality, have some part of the Bible we really don't like, right? Um, so we need to realize that God is wise and good, and his commands are wise and good. So when he says we should be giving, open, forgiving, communicative, faithful, hardworking, honest, worshiping people who are slow to anger just like he is. Love covers a multitude of sins. You can think of just all of those things that are, are things that I struggle with. If God's word is good and they're in the Bible, then they are good. If his word is good, we should obey it. Number three, if all of God's works are good, then God's plan for us is good. Psalm 119, 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. 
many of us have things in our life where we can go, I wouldn't go through it again, but I am in some sense glad I went through it because there are things I learned there that I would not have learned on any other road. Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Somebody once said, and I think it may have been C.S. Lewis, but he gets attributed quotes to him all the time that he didn't say, so I'm not entirely sure. If there's anything good, either Charles Spurgeon or C.S. Lewis said it. But somebody once said, often we walk through things that look like valleys going in and turn out to be wells going out. I love that. They look like valleys going in, but on the way out, it turns out they were wells. One exa- and, and this is why that we can't look on the outside at somebody's experiences and say, how can God be good? Because we're not on the inside. Let me give you a for instance. There was a man named Alan Gardner. He was a naval captain who became a missionary. Uh, In 1851, he was shipwrecked with others off the coast of South America in the Patagonia region. Um, Everybody who shipwrecked, and he kind of started the South America mission group uh, intended to do a lot of good. Everybody who was part of that shipwreck died of hunger, including him. And when they found his dead body, so you think young missionary, zealous for the Lord, shipwrecked, watches all of his mates die, and then he finally dies himself. How can God be good? Just yards away from his body, they found his journal. And here's what he wrote in his journal. This was his last entry. He quoted Psalm 3410. Young lions lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And the final thing that Gardner wrote in a scribbling uh, hand is, I am overwhelmed with the sense of the goodness of God. Like we're not on the inside of somebody suffering. Who are we to judge, right? I mean, I can think of some of the things that Ben has said about cancer in the last year, that he can see the goodness of God in it. And so if God is good, then his creation is good, his word is good, and his plan for us is good. And the gospel is good, isn't it? The gospel comes out of the goodness of God. Titus 3 says this, For we ourselves, and this is not a great list, y'all, All right? We ourselves, so that's an emphatic, right? He could have said we were once foolish, but he makes sure to stick in there what? Don't look look past that when that happens in the Bible, right? So we ourselves were once foolish. You ever dealt with a fool? You ever been a fool? Like they're annoying, aren't they? They respond to everything in the wrong way and in a way that is like the most inconvenient way. They don't see the truth, and they keep bumping into you and other things. They're foolish. We were ourselves once foolish. Yeah, so not only were we like foolish, that is you can't see the truth. Disobedient is you can see the truth, and then what? Yeah, you don't, you go the other way. Led astray, passive, kind of foolish again. Slaves to various passions and pleasures. How can you be a slave to a pleasure? You can be a slave to a pleasure when you think that it's the most pleasurable thing. We passed our days in malice, that is just burning anger and envy, looking at others with jealousy, hated by others, and hating one another. So that's not a great list, is it? And that's something that we ourselves were once a part of. And then, of course, the best word in the Bible. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, so God our Savior is good and full of loving kindness. His goodness and loving kindness appeared. When and how did God's goodness and loving kindness appear? When Jesus appeared. Jesus was the appearance of the goodness and loving kindness of God. God, our Savior, saved us, not because of good works done by us in righteousness, but according to his... So again, just like we have we ourselves, 
emphatic his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So our sin and misery and idiocy was met with the goodness and loving kindness of God, not because of the, our good, completely generated out of his own mercy, which he effected in us by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out. So did he drop it with an eyedropper? No, it poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is a good verse, of course, for you Jehovah's Witnesses, friends, because Jesus is called the Savior there, and God is called the Savior there. The gospel is good. I mean, my goodness. What would life be like if you didn't know that like, you were forgiven? And, and not only are you forgiven, what would life be like if you didn't know you had help? And what would life be like if you didn't know there was someone faithful to you through thick and thin? And, not, and the best news about all of it is it's not because you've merited it or earned it or because you're anything. It's all motivated out of his own goodness. Like that's the best news of all of it, isn't it? Because it means that if it never depended on me, then it's not going to depend upon me at any point in the future. That God in his goodness has determined to save us, and because of his merciful determination, it's going to happen, and we're going to end up on a new heaven and a new earth when we were foolish, disobedient, led astray slaves who were malicious and envious, being hated and hated one another, and God is determined, as Ephesians 2 says, to show how good he can be to wicked people. What would we do if we didn't have that? And so the gospel is good, just like all of God's works are good. But let's apply this. First thing you should do if God is good, is you should live under good skies. What do I mean by that? Well, I can tell you, as an anxiety sufferer, I don't often live under good skies. I think I'm living under falling skies. But that's not right. Listen to what A.W. Tozer says. The whole outlook of mankind might be changed if we could all believe that we dwell under a friendly sky and that the God of heaven, though exalted in power and majesty, is eager to be friends with us. But sin has made us timid and self-conscious, as well it might. Years of rebellion against God have bred in us a fear that cannot be overcome in a day. The captured rebel does not enter willingly the presence of the king he has so long fought unsuccessfully to overthrow. And we live more as if that's still the truth instead of that is the truth. But God is eager to be friends with us. And we need to not let timidness or self-consciousness stand in the way. The first thing we should do if God is good is we should live in the good of the gospel. Secondly, we should taste that the Lord is good. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Now, I can define goodness biblically, I think. I can define goodness somewhat philosophically. I can, can tell, tell you how it flows out of God's nature. I can give you some propositional truths to believe. You know, and at the beginning I said, we don't want to say that God is good like we say that food is good. But after we know the technical definition and after we know the biblical truth, then I would argue we need to come to the point that we can say that the Lord is good like food is good. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I can say this coffee is good, which I shouldn't have in here. Um, I can say this coffee is good in that it like fits all the markers of coffee. It's got an appropriate level of acidity and bitterness, right? It comes from a coffee bean. It was hot when I put it in the cup. It steamed. It was good coffee in the sense that it was what coffee should be. But then I drink it and I go, hmm, that's, that's good. 
And if God is good, then once you know the way that God is good and the, the means by which God is good to us, then this is actually the difficult bit. Then you need to taste that the Lord is good and say, mm, God is, God's good. Uh, and so where are you at today? Do you live under friendly skies or do you live under timid and self-conscious skies? Have you realized that in spite of your rebellion, God is eager to be friends with you? I think if you just believe that truth, it would revolutionize your quiet time. Why? Because you wouldn't be doing your quiet time to make God happy. You would enter into his presence because God was already happy. Right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be trying to prove yourself in your quiet time. That's what always makes it difficult for me. Right? That I'm so ridiculously ignorant that I enter into my quiet time emotionally as if I'm doing this, I don't know, to fill a quota, to be impressive, to make God happy. We said God's already happy, uh, and God is eager to spend time with you. You're not trying to prove anything when you read your Bible and pray. You're trying to spend time with God and taste the goodness of God. And so, uh, this week, tomorrow, when you crack your Bible open, don't crack it open as if, as if you're trying to be impressive to the Lord. Crack it open as if he went through a lot of trouble to inspire that thing to bless you with. Instead of cracking your Bible open, figuring out whether it's going to be a good quiet time or a bad, it's always a good quiet time when you're reading the good word of a good God who has a good plan, who gave you a good gospel, Right? And we need to enter into, who is it that says fly the friendly skies, Mike? And, well, then they're no good. Only Delta is good. <laughs> but, but you're under friendly skies. And you're under friendly skies only and ever and always because for you and your salvation, out of mercy and pity and love, Jesus undertook your poor estate to redeem it and to suffer in your place. He earned everything that ever needed to be earned for God to be good to you. And that's exactly why God is good to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Please bless your word and help us to believe it and to taste and see that you are good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.